Our final speaker today is Andrew Hinkies. Andrew represents leading companies and entrepreneurs in state and federal commercial litigation matters related to contract litigation, representation of court-appointed fiduciaries, business torts, bankruptcy adversarial litigation, employment-regulated litigation, and electronic discovery. Andrew also advises clients regarding document retention issues, management of electronically stored information, electronic records management strategies, and website terms of service and privacy policies. Andrew is frequently published and cited for his work in the virtual currency area and is a noted authority in the areas of virtual currencies, smart contracts, distributed ledger-based technologies, computer data security breaches, and technology regulation. Today, Andrew will be speaking on the law of forks. Please welcome Andrew Hinkes. My name is Andrew Hinkis. I'm a trial lawyer practicing in South Florida, and I'm excited to talk to you today about forking blockchains, what, the, what it means, what happens, when it happens, and some potential legal issues related to the uh, blockchain forks. So I want to talk about specifically what happened recently when Ethereum instituted a fork, why it did it, what happened when it forked, and what might happen a little down the ways in the future for Ethereum. And this is an important discussion to have because we're going to more than likely see the issue of forking come up in the context of Bitcoin um, as it deals with block size issues. So I'm excited to be with everyone today. Welcome, and let's dive right into it here. To understand what a fork is, we've got to need to start at the beginning and talk a little bit about what a blockchain is. Um, there is, to my knowledge, not a consensus definition on what a blockchain is. I like to think of a blockchain as a peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger that uses a consensus mechanism to add blocks of new transactions, and that consensus mechanism is distributed, which eliminates the need for a third party to validate transactions. Blockchains based on proof of work generally create what are called immutable records. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily true, it just means that they're not to be changed once they're appended to the blockchain ledger. Now they're not necessarily immutable to a mathematical certainty, but they are rendered immutable because they are economically difficult to overwrite or modify. Adam Back of Hashcash fame calls it a computational irrevocability. Now, immutability or the strength of the immutability increases with the size of the network or the social consensus of that network in the absence of any defined exceptions where immutability may be overcome. Now, when I say a defined exception where immutability may be overcome, I mean, of course, an agreement. And we'll talk about what kind of agreements may or may not exist among participants in blockchain platforms in a little bit. Those agreements would typically dictate the terms by which immutability can be overcome or be temporarily suspended. Um, but we're going to see that sometimes immutability, despite being a very attractive feature, can actually be overcome by consensus of participants. Um, these agreements, like I mentioned, they generally don't exist. And these systems generally function by virtue of their operation without any clear rules or allocations of rights and responsibilities. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But generally, these platforms have their power because of their record-keeping function and because of the ability to decentralize the verification function. Um, so generally speaking, we, we call proof-of-work powered ledgers um, immutable. However, because there are no agreements and there is no law per se in place, at least for Bitcoin, we can look at the functionality of blockchains as a governance model. And by calling it a governance model, I mean it's sort of law without the law. It is what everyone agrees to observe. Um, and these are typically implemented, at least in Bitcoin, through economic incentives. We have an economic incentive baked into the protocol. We pay people to do the validation work through the uh, reward block. We have economic incentives to avoid a 51% attack. The entire business model, the entire value proposition of Bitcoin would become invalid and the token would lose its market value if any 51% attacker was able to start writing their own transactions. So although Bitcoin doesn't have a business entity and it doesn't have necessarily a central issuer or a corporate owner, and even though there aren't formal contracts governing the behavior of its participants, Bitcoin has a governance system. And so we kind of talk about it in the context of 
what is a, a social system that includes developed social mores that its participants have to um, observe in order to keep the system functioning properly and to preserve the wealth created by a, an adequately functioning system. Um, and so those social mores are in fact the governance system that's created by Bitcoin. They suggest how the system's going to run um, and they do this in place of formalized contracts. Now, these mores in this governance system, of course, does not create the same power or rights that a conventional governmentally enforceable agreement would create. Um, if in circumstances where there is a controversy about a system like a blockchain, if there are to be any actual enforceable legal rights, they're either going to be found in agreements between participants, which typically don't exist, unless you're talking about smart contracts, which we'll get to, or they'd be found in the terms and conditions of the platforms if they have any, and we're going to look at some of those in a moment, um, or they're going to be imputed by the, legal uh, by the legal system operating in your jurisdiction. So, so that's why we say that without legal contracts, we likely have limited participant legal recourse. Now, let's talk a little bit about what forks are themselves. Okay? Forks are a term that the crypto community has borrowed from the software development community. And a fork literally means that a common source code is developed in a separate path from another person or party who's developing that same source code so in a way where it winds up being distinct from other software. It can happen where a project developer simply disagrees with someone else and decides to implement a different functionality. It's, it also happens when a project is being worked on by a group and it's either abandoned or it dies and then somebody else revives it. A, a good example of that is LibreOffice turning into OpenOffice. That was a fork. Uh, forks typically meet one of four fates. Either the fork is going to die, it's going to remerge into the main trunk of the development, the prior version dies and the new fork becomes the main trunk, or a fully distinctive branch is born and a distinctive system continues in its own uh, evolution. So let's talk about what happens with forks in the context of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. When an alternate version of an operating blockchain is created, they call it a fork. And it can happen for any number of reasons. It can be to implement a fix, which we've seen uh, in Bitcoin. It can be to update code functionality. And in the case of what Ethereum just experienced, it can be to rewrite a specific transaction uh, recorded on its blockchain. Now, among these types of forks, we can pull them into two broad categories, soft forks and hard forks. Soft forks are a change to the protocol where only previously valid blocks or transactions are made invalid because old nodes on the network will, participate, will recognize the new blocks as valid, a soft fork is backward compatible. This kind of fork requires only a majority of the miners upgrading to enforce the new rules. And that way it's not that different than 51% attack the majority rules and implements its new reality. Now, soft forks don't require nodes to upgrade to maintain consensus because the blocks with the new soft fork code have new rules, but it will also follow the old rules. Therefore, the older clients will accept them. Once a soft fork is implemented, it cannot be reversed without a hard fork because a soft fork by definition only allows the set of valid blocks to be a proper subset of what was, a valid, of what was valid pre fork. Now, hard forks, on the other hand, are a permanent divergence in the blockchain that has to be implemented by all participants. In a hard fork, non-upgraded nodes can't validate blocks created by upgraded nodes that follow the new consensus rules. A shorthand way to think of the difference is that a hard fork is a backwards incompatible alteration to the consensus mechanism. This is what happened in Ethereum to rewrite its ledger history to back out a single transaction. And this is the type of fork that may be necessary to alter the block size limit for Bitcoin. So we talked about how forks might develop in one of two ways. Either there's a schism within the developer community, or there's a new system and there's new features. Um, or I'm sorry, or there's an irrevocable upgrade, which is basically somebody changes the system so that it is not going to be backward compatible. Now, when is a fork in software typically called for or adopted? It's simple. It's when market forces determine that it's necessary. So in the case of a cryptocurrency platform, uh, the intent in forking a consensus-based system is that the fork either solves a significant problem or establishes the definitive new version of the system as a result of some commercial or technical need. 
um, if it's a soft fork implemented solution, it only requires 51% adoption. If it's a hard fork, it requires 100% adoption. Um, so we all know that with open source projects, there could be multiple developers or teams working on various projects or upgrades at any given time. Um, and so proposed updates can come sometimes with much fanfare and sometimes very quietly. We saw just the other day that Voldemort, who's an otherwise unknown cryptographer, came out of the blue to propose a scaling solution called Mimblewimble. Now, will that be considered as seriously as proposals from, say, Peter Todd or Jeff Garzik? That remains to be seen. But Bitcoin is a very open platform, and in more centralized platforms like Ethereum, the issuing developer's identity may be more important in certain cases than the actual code upgrade itself. Thus, for developers with reputational capital uh, in their community, their patches or upgrades are possibly more likely to be implemented. Um, those actors may in fact wield disproportionate influence and power when proposing system upgrades. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that users still have to upload the code to implement the system upgrades, there should be a distinction between proposals from folks that just out of the blue like Voldemort suggest an upgrade and proposals from actors who may have a disproportionate amount of market power. So let's talk a little bit more about exactly what happened with Ethereum when it forked. The Ethereum fork was implemented to avoid what was perceived as a negative participant behavior, that is the attack on the DAO and the resulting acquisition of a large amount of Ether by the attacker. Now this fork was instituted to avoid the single transaction, which was the withdrawal of, or the transfer of ether to the attacker. So in this instance, it's like somebody lost a bet, but was still able to get their money back because the offeror of the currency system was willing to just pretend the bet never happened. Now in fairness, this was a lot of other people's money. I think it was valued at about 60 million at the time. So this was a rather large bet being made with other people's money. And a lot of people were very upset to lose their money. And a lot of people were very pleased to see their money reclaimed. Now, as a result of the attack initially, the value of the Ether fell, the value of DAO tokens also plummeted, and so it impacted the entire community of Ethereum users financially. Um, immediately upon learning of the attack, the Ethereum Foundation proposed two options to fix a problem. These were known as the hard and the soft fork. The proposed soft fork would have permitted the attacker's funds to be blacklisted and be unspendable on the Ethereum system. Further investigation, I think by my colleague Emin, who you heard from earlier, uh, revealed that that was not really a robust solution that was going to uh, solve the problem. Um, ultimately, the community determined that it wanted to implement a hard fork solution. Uh, there was a supposedly unanimous vote trotted around that showed 97% of participating voters favoring the hard fork. This vote, however, was something like 2% of the overall Ethereum participants, so it wasn't necessarily representative. There were other reports that in other surveys, something like 65% of miners that were polled did not support the hard fork. But the hard fork, the hard fork happened, it was implemented, and as a result, we live in a world where there was a hard fork implemented to avoid a single transfer. This it was You'd probably be surprised to hear, or not surprised here, I should say, heavily criticized. Some suggested that it showed that large enough um, transfers, if they were considered inequitable or due to buggy code, would be rolled back in certain circumstances, but not all. It's unclear as to whether this one particular smart contract failure sets the precedent for future failures to be rolled back as well, or whether there's some uh, magnitude of transfer that has to occur in order for a rollback by hard fork to take place. It seems to scream ad hoc treatment. Chuck Hoskinson said that when you start intervening, it kind of diminishes the entire purpose of these types of systems in general. So others like me think of it as an example of ad hoc governance that destabilizes the idea of these platforms being immutable. So, but that's ultimately how the system went. The third option was to mount Gox's system altogether and let it survive let it keep going, and everyone takes their loss. This did not happen, however. The result of the hard fork was supposed to be that a new version of Ethereum emerges, which included a reverse of the attack transaction, and that the old fork would die off. Of course, we all know now that what happened was actually a bifurcation of Ethereum into ETC, or Ethereum Classic, and the regular post-hard fork Ethereum. 
Now, it's been gospel as far as um, the expected governance of blockchains, that when there is a fork, the newer superior fork lives on and that the older one dies. The conventional behavior suggests that Ethereum Classic should have already died by now or would have been abandoned almost immediately. But obviously, we know that the opposite occurred here. Um, why did this happen? It's not 100% clear why it happened. It could be that the attacker, finding that they still have some assets in Ethereum Classic, decided that they wanted to fund the maintenance of that fork. It could be that there are folks who think that blockchains should stay immutable and that when Bitcoin did not fork to avoid the Mt. Gox loss, it stayed just as strong because it was immutable and that Ethereum should do the same thing. Platforms can survive losses and theft events and other mishaps as long as they stay immutable, as long as the platform still works. Those folks may have thought that ad hoc determinations of when to fork and how to fork um, weaken the prospect of the platform altogether and that the chain that does not include ad hoc determinations of when to fork would be more powerful. Now, the counter argument to this position advanced by Ethereum is that they intend to, in short order, go from a proof of work consensus mechanism to a proof of stake mechanism and that allowing a uh, hostile actor to have a large amount of stake would be expected to create future problems. This creates a slippery slope issue, which is ultimately what circumstances call for a fork and what circumstances do not. And this is something that could easily be handled by written agreements to regulate the governance of the entity. If everybody understood the circumstances in which a hard fork would be implemented in order to avoid an arm's length transaction, then everyone would understand what would be expected when a major loss event like the Dow attack occurs. However, in light of the lack of any governance on this issue or agreement on this issue, it remains entirely ad hoc and unpredictable. And in my personal view, destabilizes the value of Ethereum going forward since you never know whose transfer is going to be rolled back. Well, what if there had been that kind of agreement between Ethereum and its user base? What if somebody actually understood what its legal rights were? You might be surprised to know there is one. Let's take a little walk down the relevant parts of Ethereum's legal agreement with its users. I'm going to show you the parts that disclose and discuss the risks allocated between Ethereum and its users. And again, it's a lengthier document, but I'm only showing you the parts that are relevant for our discussion here. The first risk disclosure says, and I quote, if you mess something up or break any laws while using the software, it's your fault and your fault only. What that tells you is that Ethereum may not work as planned, and that should resonate with everyone because we are fundamentally using experimental software. It's entirely possible that there could be a bug in Solidity, which we've seen many. It's possible that you can make a smart contract that doesn't work the way that you expect. We saw that with the DAO. So that's what they're saying there. The second provision I highlighted says that the user expressly knows and agrees that the user is using Ethereum at user's sole risk. Okay, so here we go. You're using this at your own risk. The third thing comes from a longer provision that talks about how Ethereum carves itself out from having any liability for any damage that its users may suffer. If you look at the last three lines, it says, in particular, nothing in these terms shall affect the statutory rights of any user or exclude injury arising from willful misconduct or fraud of Stiftung Ethereum. Stiftung Ethereum is defined to include the Ethereum developers um, and others on the development team. Now what this actually says to you is, you're responsible for your own actions if you mess something up. You own it. You expressly know and agree that you're using it at your own risk. Uh, nothing in these terms shall affect the statutory rights of the users, and there could be other Ethereum networks that pop up. Look at that. You might get another Ethereum network, but what is that Ethereum network going to be? Is that an official or an unofficial network? What is an official or an unofficial Ethereum network? I don't see that in the definition. I don't see anyone or anyone anywhere that tells me what the quote-unquote official Ethereum network is. If this is truly open source code, and if this is truly something that is being developed by the community, I'm having a hard time understanding what an unofficial or official Ethereum network looks like. Is the Ethereum Classic network considered an unofficial Ethereum network because it has been forked away from when the day before it was the official network? Is the new post-fork network now the official network? Um, it kind of flies in the face of an open source 
set of software and an open source program to say that something is official or unofficial. And um, I'm not entirely clear what exactly this provision is supposed to mean. Now let's look at the next, uh, the next slide. We've got some more provisions. They say it might not work as planned. They say that it might be buggy and the dev team may, or, or developers that are not affiliated with the dev team may introduce bugs that result in you losing your ether or a sum of other valued tokens issued on the Ethereum platform. That sounds a lot like the DAO. Um, this would have been used by e Ethereum if they were sued for any exposure as a result of the DAO hack. They would have said that they expressly noted that there was potential liability to users as a result of bugs and that they are not liable for user losses as a result of bad contracts. Um, they would have probably interposed this as a defense and it might have been successful. The third disclosure on this slide is that cryptography may advance and as a result their cryptographic proofs may be, sub, uh, may be available or open to attack which would then result in the cryptography that is key to all proof of work systems being outdated and hackable and at that point all bets are off here. So taking all this together what do we see? We see user beware, we have no exposure for your losses. We have some sort of statement about what an official or unofficial Ethereum blockchain might look like, but we don't have any clarity as to that. And I don't really have an understanding as to whether Ethereum Classic or the post fork Ethereum is in fact the official or unofficial Ethereum. Finally, we've got, of course, because there were lawyers involved at some point, we've got a dispute resolution term. Now, this dispute resolution term is better than nothing. It is good that Ethereum was thinking about potential claims against it, um, but the terms that, that exist right here may not be so friendly to its users. We all know that blockchains reside on the internet, which is stateless and borderless. Uh, notwithstanding that, we've all probably been aware that there's litigation over occurrences over the internet all the time. United States jurisdictional analysis has embraced the internet um, and now includes in its tests uh, provision for determining whether the conduct of a website um, advertisement and availing itself of the business of certain states would result in a finding of personal jurisdiction over that website. However, we've got websites that are owned by companies. Here we've got blockchains that are operated by decentralized platforms or in the case of Ethereum, a slightly more centralized platform it is entirely possible that jurisdiction could be had against Ethereum Foundation for the acts it undertakes on Ethereum, notwithstanding the issue of how those acts are implemented, which we'll talk about a little bit. In this case, though, Ethereum is incorporated in Switzerland. Um, it imposes upon you an alternate dispute resolution term of its choice, and you'll see that it is very friendly to Ethereum. Um, it provides that there is mandatory arbitration through the ICC, which is the International Chamber of Commerce. Not a surprise, it's a very well-known international arbitration uh, forum and uh, not a bad choice for them. Um, you have a duty to negotiate in good faith with Ethereum prior to bringing a claim, and that's not irregular or strange. Um, negotiate in good faith doesn't really have a definition, but it's probably more than sending a nasty letter or a threatening phone call. If you look in the provision, it says that the arbitrators actually have to be Swiss residents. Again, Ethereum is based on Switzerland, so they're getting folks in their home nation acting as the arbitrators. Arbitrators in this context are like judges, but they don't have all the power of judges. Um, arbitrators are paid for by the parties, and they are selected sometimes in certain circumstances by the parties or a combination of the parties. The arbitration is to be um, conducted in Zug, Switzerland. Again, this is easy for Ethereum because they are in Zug, Switzerland. And if you are anywhere but Zug, Switzerland, you need to be in Zug, Switzerland to participate in this arbitration. The discovery that the parties are permitted to take is limited. There's no depositions or examinations under oath with the exception of those conducted at formal hearings. This means that you're not going to get a chance to ask the other person in your suit a question until you're before the arbitrators. The arbitrators themselves decide who pays their costs. That means that you might bring your claim and win, and you might be assessed the cost for the arbitration. You might bring your claim and lose, you might be assessed the cost of arbitration and get nothing. Finally, this provision says that these terms are binding on the parties. So how do I read this? 
I read this as being skewed in favor of Ethereum. Now, I know that the Swiss pride themselves on neutrality. They have since World War I, I guess. Um, and so I would never cast aspersions on the Swiss people or on any arbitrators or on the ICC for their neutrality. However, in this case, you're in Ethereum's hometown dealing with arbitrators from Ethereum's home nation. So that's something to think about. If you are familiar with US style litigation, you're gonna see that this is a very different procedure. You don't have discovery in the conventional sense. <clears throat> you don't have direct and cross-examination on the stand. Instead, direct testimony is gonna be provided basically through an affidavit that will have it attached to it a bunch of documents you wish to have considered in evidence, and then the witness will be cross-examined during the hearing, um, and the witnesses have to be available. So let's talk about this. If you think you have a claim against Ethereum, when does it make sense in light of this legal agreement to bring your claim? Well, first you gotta think about, I gotta get to Switzerland, I gotta get a lawyer, and I might have to pay the arbitrators. So you're looking at a pretty expensive endeavor. I would say, personal opinion, that it doesn't make sense to bring a claim unless it's for less than uh, at least about half a million dollars. Now, I've been talking about forks, but first I talked about the immutability of ledgers. And you're probably thinking to yourself, wait, I thought blockchains were supposed to be immutable. What, what are we talking about here for changing blockchains? The answer is yes, they are supposed to be immutable unless apparently the participants all decide otherwise. This rule goes for functionality updates to history, like we saw in Ethereum, and it goes to functionality upgrades as to consensus, as we may see soon with Bitcoin. Better minds than me have discussed this issue. Both Tim Swanson and Vitalik have argued that after a fork, it's the community's economic consensus that determines which chain is legitimate. But this is only part of the point. If you're using a blockchain, you're probably using it because you want predictability and because you want the power to consent around a history of transfers. But there may come a time when you don't agree as to that history, and you maybe hold votes to see whether your public actually wants to change that history. It's still no big deal unless it's your transaction and your value that's being changed. A lot of people got really excited about the prospect of code is law. We're going to invent smart contracts that do everything that law does and accommodates every potential claim so that you can have things that just work and we don't need the justice system. Well, I got news for you. This lawyer thinks that code is code and law is law. When everything is going great and everyone's making money, everybody loves to talk about how the code is doing everything for them. However, when things go off the rails, when people start to lose money, they do what they do in every other circumstance, which is they look for recourse. Whether that recourse is through self-help, like a, a car lender, or like a lender for uh, an auto loan that can go and repo the car, or whether they try through the legal system, such as someone who wants to get a divorce or who has a claim against somebody for a breach of contract. Now, before the fork was implemented by Ethereum, I argued that the attacker would have claims if any action was taken by the Ethereum Foundation or Ethereum community to reverse the attack. Now, this claim is in fact supported by the terms of the Ethereum legal agreement that we looked at, which suggests not just buyer beware and that because of the arbitration provision, only a very well-funded party can sue, but it says that there are still good claims out there for intentional torts and gross negligence. Now, would a fork that targets your specific holdings unilaterally, specifically just your transfer, would you view that as intentional? I would argue that's the definition of intentional. It's focused just on you for the specific purpose of reversing your transfer or your transaction. Now, you might look at it and say, well, Drew, I don't really know if that's going to fall under intentional torts, and maybe it has to be something that's really aggravated or something that is you know, beyond what a normal person should expect to have to suffer through, so maybe it's not an intentional tort. So then maybe we're stuck with these terms, right? Well, maybe not. Judge Rakoff of the Southern District of New York recently entered an opinion in a case in a class action brought against Uber, which suggested that click wrap or browse wrap agreements that take away critical legal rights, such as the right to a jury, may be illusory and may be um, marked out by a court. In the Uber case, it was a waiver of jury trial. It was found that it was not expressly required by the parties who were entering into the click wrap agreement to agree to waive jury trial and that it wasn't presented to them in a way where they understood what they were doing. And as a result, Rakoff said, your jury waiver doesn't apply. Perhaps 
a similar argument could be made about the Ethereum legal agreement, which would take that shield away and give folks the right to bring a claim. If the judge did overrule those terms, then of course claims could be uh, attempted in basically any jurisdiction where the claimant could convince a judge that the judge could exercise personal jurisdiction over Ethereum. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, folks involved in Ethereum have very strong opinions as to the, the hard fork that was implemented. Some think that it was absolutely the right thing to do, that it preserved the integrity of the chain, that it prepared them to go to a proof of stake system, and that it preserved the value for all holders of Ethereum Ether. Some will tell you that it was more foreseeable that a fork would be implemented because forks are actually part of what Ethereum plans to do as it implements its overall scheme to build a worldwide distributed multi-state Turing complete computer. And I'm aware that that is part of the development roadmap, but that sort of underscores my point here. Forks when they are expected and when all participants know that they're going to happen and when they are anticipated in order to do something that everyone agrees should happen are totally okay. That's called development of software. And in that circumstance, I have no, this is just me personally, I have no objection to making a fork of a, pro, of a system under that circumstance. However, this was a circumstance in which not everyone shared the same information. Not everyone went into their use of the Ethereum platform understanding that this sort of fork could or would occur. And there's no clarity as to the circumstances going forward in which such a fork would actually be implemented on a go-forward basis. If I had Ethereum right now, I would have no way to really know whether my future transaction was going to be dialed back at some point because somebody else determined that it was a bad transaction for the integrity of the platform. Forks, when they're deployed to reverse a single arm's length transaction, seem ad hoc and entirely ad, uh, arbitrary. How can you get around this? Publicize to the people using your platform when you intend to use forks and not. The circumstances in which a fork may occur so that they understand. They have notice, and thus they will not be surprised by an action taken which appears to unilaterally single them out to take value away from them. So let's talk about this attacker. Now that the fork has happened, and it's not just threatened, what claims might this attacker have? Well, they could look at it and say, tortious interference. I had these coins. I had these ethers. They were Ethereum ethers. After the fork, I only have Ethereum Classic Ethers. You interfered with my ability to use the regular Ethers by forking the blockchain and putting me in this minority chain where I have this thing that's worth less. So you've tortuously interfered with my right to use my Ether. The second thing you could say is that you detrimentally, rel sorry, detrimentally relied on the prospect of immutability and in others like Stefan Tool who said, code is law. I thought that the code was the law because you told me that the code was the law. And if the code says that I can do X, Y, Z, and I do X, Y, Z, I thought I was complying with the law. However, you changed the rules on me afterwards to my harm. That's a detrimental reliance claim. And then finally, they could claim a breach of fiduciary duty. That would require um, the Ethereum Foundation, maybe, to be considered fiduciaries of those who participate in the system. Now, I'm sure a lot of us have heard the word fiduciary, but its meaning may not be so clear, so I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit. A fiduciary is nothing more than a person who owes a very, very high level duty to another person. Think a doctor, think a lawyer, think a business partner. A fiduciary is a person who owes the highest level of trust and duty to another person. Now, whether you want to hold um, if you want to discuss whether Ethereum's developers can be considered fiduciaries to their token holders, Professor Walsh did a better job of it than I ever will, and I encourage you to read her paper and think about it and talk about it. Um, I think she published it in American Banker. Uh, there's an argument to be made that those who issue these systems <coughs> actually owe duties to those who use them. The duties may be simply common law duties, meaning a duty that the thing works right, or they could be fiduciary duties, meaning I'm handling your money and thus you are reposing so much trust in me that a higher level of duty is owed. The argument would be that maintaining the system, that by maintaining the system and determining its functionality, <coughs> the Ethereum Foundation owes its users a duty of care. Now, if you brought these claims, what would your damages be? At this point, because 
Ethereum Classic actually still has some sort of value, it would be the diminution of value at the time that the fork occurred between what Ethereum was worth at the time of the fork and what Ethereum Classic is worth now. The delta, the difference in between, would probably be the amount of damages. Now, is this claim plausible? Is anybody going to actually bring this claim? Well, it's unlikely, but maybe not as unlikely as you think. There are two main reasons why the attacker would not want to bring a claim. The first would be that they don't want to tell the world I'm the attacker. Okay? There are folks out there who think that the hack or the attack was a criminal act. I don't know for sure. I don't think anybody knows for sure. <clears throat> However, there are plenty of folks who think, I put money in, I had an expectation of a return, you took my money. So from that vantage point, sure, it might be a criminal act. Um, the other idea would be that by bringing a civil claim, <clears throat> the attacker may be concerned that their identity would become public. However, arbitration is not a public proceeding. It's private. So conceivably, if there was some sort of agreement that criminal action would not be brought, it's possible that the attacker could proceed in arbitration without any worry of their name being exposed, notwithstanding the fact that any party at any time, whether if they're bound by confidentiality, would have liability for exposing the name of the other party, and if they're not, they wouldn't. So that's another sort of nuance there. Finally, as we kind of discussed, international arbitration is super expensive. So unless your loss is in the magnitude of millions plus, 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 it's probably not even economically advantageous to do this. Now let's look and pivot toward Bitcoin. Okay? Bitcoin, for about the last year and a half, has had a bit of an internal civil war over the prospect of block size. Currently, block size is fixed at one megabyte. That creates a concern that if there is too much traffic, Bitcoin will not be able to scale up to handle the transactions being submitted for verification. Currently, blocks are capped at one megabyte. If a miner submits a block that is over one megabyte, it will be rejected and considered invalid. Most of the proposals, and I've, I've listed a whole bunch of them there, require hard forks in order to change the block size. Um, I don't need to get into these. I'm not advocating for any specific proposal, whether it's an on-chain, off-chain, whether it's a soft fork or a hard fork. There are far smarter people than me out there that have made wonderful arguments as to why some of these um, make more sense than others. I know that there is no industry consensus right now. I'm simply showing these for the purpose of illustrating to those who may not know that there have been a number of proposals out there. To be clear, this is the type of proposal that changes the functionality of a um, cryptocurrency blockchain, and it is not specifically targeted at any one transaction. It's intended to change the way that the system actually works. I don't expect that any sort of illusory vote like the one conducted by Ethereum would be used to determine whether any of these proposals is the one that gets implemented or not. Um, unlike Ethereum that had a lot of different concerns than Bitcoin, Bitcoin only really does one thing at its core, and that is move Bitcoins from participant to participant on the network. So the block size controversy touches on really the only thing that blockchain, uh, I'm sorry, that Bitcoin really is concerned about, and that is the value of the Bitcoin. Um, I don't see a unilateral hard fork being issued and implemented by everyone because one party thinks that it's going to be the best one. I think it's going to be the subject of a lot of social and political consensus among participants in the system, that is node operators and miners. So which one of these is the best? I don't know. Which one's going to work best? I don't have a clue. Uh, which one of these is going to gain a majority? Couldn't tell you. Will everybody be happy? Probably initially the answer to that is no. Now if a fork occurs in order to address the block size concern, will Bitcoin suffer Ethereum's fate? Are we going to see Bitcoin shatter into multiple forks? Are we going to see people using the old chain, devaluing the new chain? Are we going to see games being played with respect to mining? Well, a couple questions there. Are we going to see it devolve into multiple forks? I think yes, there's going to be a majority and a minority fork when a hard fork occurs. This is an issue that the community has struggled with um, for at least a year. And as we saw in the prior slide, multiple credible proposals do exist. It would be pretty surprising if a single fork occurred that was unilaterally accepted without significant coordination among participants. Even in the context of that unilateral fork, it would be expected that the minority chain would persist for some time. Now, why is that? I see two really good reasons. First, a new fork could be viewed as experimental, and thus it would have risk baked into the operation. The old fork 
<coughs> may be maintained as a hedge in case of an unexpected bug or failure that causes a system a, a, a system wide failure after the upgrade. Now, like Ethereum Classic, there could be a group that opts out and says, we don't need to change Bitcoin, it's perfect the way it is. Those folks may desire to keep operating the old fork, and they and their resources, their miners, may continue to devote energy in order to create new coins and prop up the trading value of that blockchain. Um, alternatively, since nobody really knows how this is going to go, there could be a non-majority cartel, say 60-70%, that decides that they're going to imp uh, implement one of the hard fork-based solutions, and another major group of miners opts out. And you might end up with a splintering of Bitcoin blockchains due to a number of different hard forks. This would temporarily create some chaos and probably lead to a devaluation of the main that is the majority controlled chain for a time. But since we know that the miners are self-interested and motivated by the reward as well as the control of the network, the larger miners and perhaps a cartel of miners would ultimately make the decision to support a single chain that would be the majority chain that emerges long term. So again, two realistic scenarios. 90 plus percent of the miners agree to implement a scenario. It becomes the majority chain with the minority chain persisting for some time as a hedge against a failure or an, uh, an unanticipated bug, and that the minority chain ultimately becomes trivially used or is used for experimental platforms only. Um, if a less than super majority of miners agree, one cartel could uh, pull the trigger on its own fork, and multiple splinter forks could be created. This would lead to chaos, short-term overall devaluation, but ultimately the emergence of a single platform. Either way, um, a fork does not appear to spell ultimate doom for Bitcoin. Now, we saw that Ethereum Classic has actually not necessarily hurt the trading value of Ethereum itself. I believe, collectively, its market cap is above what the market cap was of Ethereum at the time of the fork. Uh, the same would likely be observed here. So there's an interesting question posed to me in, a, uh, in advance of this talk, which was, after a fork, what is Bitcoin exactly? Now, we know that Bitcoin itself is defined by Satoshi's white paper and the code that was released implementing it. And there may be purists who say, as soon as you change the core of what Satoshi was doing, you're no longer doing Bitcoin, you're doing something else. Now, there could also be groups that look at, say, the soft fork that was implemented in 2010 and say that was a material change to the code and that there are updates released fairly regularly. Um, how is that a material change to what Satoshi intended to do? How is this change different than that change? Um, and really, it comes down to kind of an interesting argument. Do the miners define what Bitcoin is or does the software define what Bitcoin is? I don't know the answer. There's a lot smarter people out there than me that can probably help me um, come to a resolution with that one, but I leave that out there for you to ponder. Um, so let's talk about in the world where the hard fork happens, would anybody want to sue anybody about anything? Typically, you've got to have somebody who got hurt in order to bring a claim. Who would actually be victimized as a result of a hard fork? There may be, while two chains are maintained, a group that says, by implementing this fork, you've ruined Bitcoin forever. But how do you actually quantify that into recoverable damages? It's possible with a hard fork that participants may actually want to maintain both. You may find that in the aggregate, a Bitcoin after the fork, where there might be you know, Bitcoin 1 and Bitcoin 2, may actually have more aggregate value. And there may not be a loser at all. I'm not sure if there's a loser who may have rights to be vindicated. But if you wanted to, let's say that you, you did have a loss, could you sue Bitcoin? I'm not really sure you can, and here's why. Um, one of my favorite writers in the space, a guy named Pelly Bredegaard, wrote about the veil of decentralization. And he analogizes the decentralization of Bitcoin with the veil that is provided, with the corporate veil provided by participants in a business who are not personally liable because they have incorporated the contracts entered into by the company or the company, not the individual owners or operators. The same thing happens in Bitcoin here. Although we may have core devs that are out there 
proposing ways to change the functionality, they don't own the system. They don't operate the system. They don't have equity in the system. They don't profit from the system because of their position or situation. They don't actually um, operate a level of control that would show that they're operating the system. Now, this is different in Ethereum, where you have a corporation that is talking about maintaining an official versus an unofficial version of the blockchain. So I view in Bitcoin the, the odds of someone being able to sue Bitcoin, so to speak, as the entity Bitcoin, I think those odds are very, very low. There has been some writing and some suggestion that Bitcoin could be considered a uh, joint venture or a um, general partnership. Under the basic American law of joint ventures or general partnerships, all participants are liable for everything that happens to that platform, irrespective of uh, their level of control or participation. That conclusion would suggest that all miners, all node operators, and even perhaps all wallet holders would be liable for all events that take place on Bitcoin. Now, while this works really well for unformed business entities, this works really poorly in the context of a decentralized cryptocurrency system like Bitcoin, because we know that node operators are doing something very different than wallet holders, and we know that core developers are doing something very different than miners. This is a circumstance in which there just isn't really a good fit. And then finally, I want to touch on the fiduciary duty issue again. I believe that the fiduciary duty exposure for core developers in Bitcoin is significantly less than that found for other platforms that are somewhat more centralized in their programmatic control like Ethereum. Unless a core developer issues a patch that gets widely implemented by Bitcoin that results in a malicious backdoor for their specific benefit or does something to destroy some value, I just don't see it. I don't think that there's a good claim there. Again, Professor Walsh, if you're listening, I'm not saying that core developers are not viewed as fiduciaries as a whole, and I'm not saying that they don't owe any duty. I'm saying that there is a weaker case to be made for Bitcoin's developers to be construed as a fiduciary because compared to Ethereum, they may have less reputational collateral behind their proposed patches or upgrades. Now, whether a fiduciary duty exists or a regular duty exists, there is possibly a claim based upon duty. The first question to be briefed in the appeal of however any judge rules on this is, is there a duty? Does a Bitcoin developer or an Ethereum developer or any other platform developer owe a duty? The argument on behalf of the aggrieved user would be, I'm relying on you to build a system that works the way you say it's going to work. The developer would say, I never said it was going to work in any way. I simply published to you the specifications. And this wasn't a push system where I forced it onto your platform like a Microsoft Windows operating system update. You voluntarily loaded this on your system. So I do not know the answer to that question. I would love to continue to have the debate that Professor Walsh started. I think it's a good one and worth talking about further. Um, the last point as to that issue is if there was a prosecution or a civil claim based upon a breach of a duty brought against a developer, it would certainly have a chilling effect um, against developers because it would signal to them that they are taking on legal liability. While it may create a world where there are contractual agreements, um, that may not be so practical with decentralized platforms like Bitcoin. So I know I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, I appreciate everybody hanging in with me. And um, I would love to open up to take some questions. Hard forks do not require all participants to upgrade. Anyone can upgrade or not upgrade. I think that's completely right. Hard forks do not require all participants to upgrade. You can absolutely opt out. However, if you do not upgrade, you do not participate in the new version of the system. I apologize if that was unclear. I think that I got it right. But if I didn't, please tell me in the Q&A. I'm always looking to learn. Um, the next question would be, uh, what are your thoughts on some threats from certain core developers that they could sue fork creators for the use of the Bitcoin trademark? Trademark is a really interesting area of the law. Um, trademark is not, uh, I, I'm not aware of anybody who's actually recorded a trademark for Bitcoin. I know that Mr. Wright um, out of the UK in Australia is seeking to um, 
obtain some patent rights with respect to certain Bitcoin and blockchain functionalities. Um, I think that anybody can sue anybody for anything they want and anybody can threaten whatever they want. Um, I think that Bitcoin, the name, has a lot of intellectual property value because it is the best known crypto asset out there. And it's the one that people who aren't in this space use when they refer to these entire platforms. They, they call them all Bitcoin, kind of like a copier is a Xerox, even though there's 20 brands that make them. Um, so the IP undoubtedly has some value. The question of a core dev having standing to sue somebody else is the more interesting question to me. Why would the core dev take the position that they actually have the right to act on behalf of quote unquote Bitcoin? What, why is a core dev the one who has the right? It's not the core dev's right, it's the system's right. So one core dev suing another core dev for using the words Bitcoin for their new project, I don't see it. It would be a really, really tough claim. Um, the next question I've got here is, uh, is there a legal possibility to disclaim a fiduciary duty by licensing BTC for code under additional license terms? The sky's the limit when it comes to agreements, okay? We have limitations on contract. You cannot contract with people who don't have capacity. You can't contract for things that are illegal. You can't contract with people who are impaired under most circumstances. And you can't contract about things that you don't have rights to yourself. So the question being asked is, can you disclaim a fiduciary duty by licensing the code under additional license terms in addition to the existing open source? I think you can try it. I think that anybody who brings claims on any of these platforms on the basis of any perceived rights has an extremely uphill battle to fight because judges, are, even with the best lawyers explaining this stuff to them, are going to have a hard time. That's just a reality. We've got really bright judges, at least in the U.S., and they can get it, but these are really foreign concepts. Now, a claim could be brought against a dev on the thought that, okay, you did something that harmed me and you owed me a duty. Would they then look at an agreement that says, I don't owe you this duty? That would be offered as an affirmative defense. Now, that may or may not be an effective defense. There are certain types of folks who can waive duties. There are certain types of folks who, depending on their position vis-a-vis -vis the claimant, cannot waive a duty. My heart surgeon can't waive a duty. My contractor or the person that sells me rebar can, can waive a duty. There are certain duties that are going to be implied by law that are not waivable. So the question is something of a deeper one than I can get into right now. The last point I would say on it is, be careful when you start making agreements, because when you start making written agreements, you start having all kinds of other obligations imputed to you. Uh, we've got a question that says, do, do you think the state has any jurisdiction over code, considering that many consider code as being speech? This is a question that winds up in the world of illegal numbers, which to me seems as ridiculous as it probably does to you. Is code speech? Sure. Is code property? Absolutely. Where is the dividing line? I'm not smart enough to tell you. However, when code is implemented and causes assets to uh, be moved or changed or causes physical realty to be affected, then you have liability for code, notwithstanding the fact that it may or may not actually be someone's speech. That's the best answer I can give you. I'm sorry. Uh, next question. Everyone using Ethereum has little to no rights. So do you think that even if all the, uh, the Ethereum Foundation founders just dumped all their coins and stopped development, nobody can sue them? I don't say that at all. I don't think that at all. I think that if an American decided they wanted to sue the Ethereum Foundation, they would have a number of hurdles they would have to traverse. First thing they're going to have to do is figure out, where are you going to sue them? If you sue them in Switzerland, you're probably not going to get very far because they're going to point in the Swiss court to the agreement that they forced upon you when you participated. That said, you're in ICC arbitration in Switzerland, dismiss your complaint and let's go play in arbitration land. If you sued them in the United States, you would have to convince a court, well, one of two things would happen. They would either simply default and you could get a judgment against them that, would, that may or may not be enforceable. You would then have to take that judgment and try to find assets of the foundation in order to actually get anything. Does the foundation have any assets? I don't know. I haven't investigated that. 
Now let's say the foundation did have assets. Let's say it owned a house, just to use a simple asset. The house is in Switzerland. So now you go to Switzerland. You've got your American judgment, and the Swiss court may or may not um, recognize it. If they don't, you're out of luck. If they do, there may or may not be procedures where the Ethereum Foundation could say, but I didn't defend because I'm not subject to that jurisdiction, but I am subject to the Swiss jurisdiction, and we're going to fight you to the death here. So you may or may not get anywhere by bringing a claim domestically. However, we talked about Judge Rakoff's opinion in the Uber case. And what the Uber case said is where drivers who were working for Uber were clicking through to set up their business relationship by using the app, they were not offered the opportunity to read, um, they were not directly in the flow of registration, offered the opportunity to read the terms and conditions, and even if they had, buried all the way at the end is this really draconian waiver of jury rights. In America, jury rights are a big deal and they are not to be waived unless the waiver is knowing, involuntary, uh, knowing intentional, and voluntary. So um, Judge Rakoff concluded based on the specifics of that case that the waiver would not be uh, enforced against the user. You, a U.S. person could bring a DEC action, a declaratory judgment action, which says to the court, I have rights in, uh, under an agreement and I want you to tell me what they mean because I'm not sure. They could bring that claim and the court, maybe if you had Judge Rakoff and had a similar situation, might say, like in the Uber case, I'm going to hold this unenforceable. And as a result, the entire terms could be tossed out. Now all of a sudden, your focus changes. How do I get the court to exercise personal jurisdiction against Ethereum? Does Ethereum actually do business, quote unquote, do business in the United States? Well, it certainly uses the wires or its platform uses the wires because we all know that we participate in Ethereum over the internet. If there's a single mining operation in the United States, boom, you probably have minimum contacts. But again, if Ethereum doesn't have any assets in the U.S., and you have to go into a hostile foreign jurisdiction, it may or may not make a difference because you may or may not get anything ultimately. Um, so that's kind of a very long-winded answer to say you can. There are a lot of roadblocks. It doesn't mean it's impossible, and it doesn't mean it's an empty, wall. It's an empty hole once you dig it. Um, do I think public blockchain developers should have a legal duty of care toward users? Do I think they should? I believe that whether they, whether they should or shouldn't, they do. And I believe that in a properly teed up case, a judge would look at it and say, you are doing these things for the benefit of the system. People are ascribing value to the system because these tokens have value. Therefore, you owe a duty. Now, what level of duty do they owe? Do they owe a duty to not intentionally put backdoors and booby traps? Do they owe a duty to make sure that it functions as it is marketed? Do they owe a duty to make sure that it is absolutely perfect? Do they owe a duty to make sure that it meets your every whim, need, and desire? These are interesting questions. I don't know the answer. But me personally, I believe that there is a, there's a continuum of duty. Okay? The person who is responsible for designing the Clip It uh, assistant that used to come with Microsoft Office, their duty is re relatively minor. The person who's implementing a hard fork that takes $60 million worth of value from another person, their duty is much higher. Um, ultimately, I think that we should all go back and read Professor Welch's paper and revisit that discussion in light of the hard fork to come. Um, I would be surprised if ultimately there were suits brought because as I suspected and kind of discussed earlier, I, I don't see a lot of losers in a hard fork unless somebody decides that they don't want the hard fork. Um, because as we saw with Ethereum's schism into Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, as long as somebody's maintaining the secondary or the, the, the child, or sorry, the, the earlier fork, so to speak, and the newer fork, sometimes you wind up with a windfall, and there isn't really any commercial harm there. Is there any precedent of which I'm aware of suits being brought due to attacks made on forks? No. There's very little precedent at all in the Bitcoin blockchain altcoin world. Um, in preparing a law review article that I'm working on, I actually went on to one of the legal research sites called Westlaw and started doing research. I found something like 44 published opinions that said anything about the word Bitcoin. And you've got the FTC's action against Butterfly Labs, you've got 
Mr. Ulbricht's action, you've got Mr. Shavers' action, you've got a couple other uh, minor cases, but very, very few of them touch on um, these sorts of doctrinal issues as to how would the law apply itself to XYZ action. They're typically regulatory enforcement actions right now, which suggests that the regulators are asking the court, did we apply our law right? Does this conduct fall within our scope? Is this conduct violative of this regulation? As far as these sorts of issues, this is all brand new ground um, to be tilled. And I, I personally think it's fascinating. Um, and I think it has the opportunity to define a lot of the, the direction of these platforms going forward. Let me see if there are any other really awesome questions that I can, I can look at here. Well, I don't see any other questions. So I'll hang out just another minute to see if anybody else has something um, that they want to chat about. Um, in the absence of any other questions, I'd love to thank everybody for hanging in and for your time. Hope you found this useful. And uh, of course, my thanks to OnChain Scaling for the opportunity to come and chat with you today. So Drew, I'd like to thank you for coming forward making this presentation. I know there's not a lot of legal precedent set for what you're doing, and it's great to have a, a thought leader uh, with us today. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank all of the presenters today, Jeff Garzik, Emin Gunsir, and of course, Andrew Henkes, for providing their time and thoughtful expertise. Thank you to everybody who has participated in our event today. I look forward to providing more information at a future date, and thank you all for attending.